Yeah, thanks. Thanks, JT. Uh, the, the bill that JT mentioned is House Bill 1913 that I introduced uh, right before session. Um, you know, everything Peter said is is absolutely right. The, the plan, uh, as it's established, is insolvent. Uh, it was insolvent on day one. We knew when we got up on the House floor and took a vote that uh, there was a day on which the plan would run out of money. Um, that problem got worse when the voters rejected a constitutional amendment to allow us to invest those funds in something other than treasuries. Uh, the problem got a lot worse this last year when, as Peter mentioned, the number of opt-outs went from the 105,000 that we uh, had modeled and assumed to 450,000. Uh, and it is still possible more individuals could submit their, their paperwork uh, going forward. Um, we haven't even updated our actuarial models to account for for that uh, opt out experience. So we don't actually know uh, what the the year in which the the fund will run out of money. And the bills that appear on the floor calendar for later this week uh, include an eighteen month delay. And if that was all we were doing, uh, perhaps that might be sufficient. But that's not all that's being done. Uh, the the other bill and, and the rest of the 18 month delay bill itself uh, belie that notion entirely. Uh, included in the 18th month delay bill is a move to uh, add more people into the system, uh, which might be fair to them, but certainly causes the system to be uh, even less well funded. Uh, and then there's another bill that allows a number of people to opt out, which again might be fair to those being allowed to opt out, but further undermines the system. Uh, and so the the majority appears to be racing through not just the delay, but uh, substantive changes to the law. And I just don't think that's the right approach. I think uh, everything Peter pointed out, everything that you can read for yourself in the actuarial report, shows that uh, this program was perhaps well intentioned, but not well executed. Uh, and what I'll say tomorrow is that good intentions alone don't make for good policy. It's probably a necessary ingredient, but it's not a sufficient ingredient. Uh, I think we need to revisit uh, this, this uh, concept and this program entirely and what we're doing in the legislature. Um, I think you'll hear the majority try to explain how good it is to have people with long-term care coverage, but as Peter pointed out, nobody's disputing that. I think there's broad bipartisan agreement that having some solution is good. The question is, what should that solution be? And I'm afraid that without giving these bills a hearing, the legislature is locking ourselves into only one particular solution that isn't really a solution at all. So instead, I introduced 1913, which would uh, leverage the state's uh, significant $8.8 .8 billion surplus to uh, stabilize the private market and allow for private insurance carriers to ultimately offer much lower premiums to subscribers like you and me uh, that were previously shut out of the market. Uh, it does this through a system of reinsurance that uh, insurers would then get a tax credit for refunded by the state. Uh, so we essentially would be leveraging the state's uh, largesse to absorb the, the riskiest portion of this market, which is why uh, coverage in the private market has been so unaffordable and unattainable before. I think it's fair to say that before 2019, the private market or, or the long-term care market was, was uh, optional for sure, but unaffordable for a lot of people who wanted it. Uh, under the Washington CARES program, I think coverage is affordable for a lot of people, but uh, it's, it's not optional. Uh, this program uh, proposed by House Bill 1913 would be the first attempt at, at a program that's both uh, optional and affordable. 